are in listen only mode. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network. Um, this webinar today is co-coordinated by, um, well the net, sorry, the, the, this webinar is being held by the EBM Tools Network, which is co-coordinated by NatureServe and uh, OpenChannels.org. And uh, we have Nick Weiner on today, who is co-moderating the webinar. So uh, welcome, uh, to, welcome today. Um, and let's see, we are pleased that Julia Lowndes and Eric Pacheco from, Conf from Julia with NCs at the UC Santa Barbara and Eric with Conservation International are going to be presenting today. They're going to be talking about the Ocean Health Index. Uh, and the title of the presentation is Transforming How We Approach Marine Science for Management. Before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know how, how to ask questions. Um, you can type, que there's a question panel in your user interface. If you type the questions in there, I will relay them to Julia and Eric. Um, and you can type questions in throughout the webinar. Um, we'll hold the substantive ones for the question and answer period at the end of the webinar. Um, but if you have a quick clarifying question, uh, I may be able to ask it during the question. That would be something like, what does an acronym stand for? That sort of thing. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Julia and Eric. We're really glad you could be with us today, and I'll turn it over to you now. Great. Um, thanks so much. I'm really excited to be here, and I wanted to thank Sarah and Nick and everybody that makes these webinars possible. Um, so I'm, I'm Julia Lowndes. I'm at NCs, and, and like Sarah said, Eric Pacheco, my colleague, is um, at Conservation International. And the Ocean Health Index is a partnership between NCs and Cons Conservation International. So our program is really, um, I think, really neat because it leverages the expertise of both science and management. Um, so Eric and I have been working together for almost four years now, and we're really excited to have the opportunity to share some of the stories um, we've learned along the way as we've been transforming how we approach marine science for management. Um, so before I get started, I also just wanted to thank our entire team because we have a really awesome team, and in particular, our directors, Ben Halpern, Johanna Polsenberg, and Steve Katona. So since we're going to be talking about stories, I thought we'd start with Kurt Vonnegut. Um, before he became a writer, he actually did his master's thesis at the University of Chicago in anthropology, and he got really fascinated in graphically representing the shapes of stories. So he created these axes where one axis is from the beginning to the end of the story, and the other is um, ill fortune to good fortune. And, um, and so one of his story arcs is called Boy Meets Girl. And it doesn't have to be about a boy meeting a girl, but that's a way that you can remember it. Um, so in this story, an ordinary person um, comes upon good fortune, but then loses it, and then ends up better off, potentially. So an example that comes to my mind immediately is um, the original Star Wars trilogy, where you would have a new hope, and then the Empire Strikes Back, and then Return of the Jedi. So I think that these are kind of cool story arcs, and um, there's, if you're interested, there's some cool recent articles about them, and also on YouTube is a um, recording of Kurt Vonnegut with a chalkboard going through some of these um, story arcs um, from back in the day, which is kind of neat. Um, but so the Ocean Health Index story follows that same boy meets girl story arc um, with that first peak, the kind of steep decline, and then the um, ascent um, higher than we had been. So um, I'm going to fill in some of these details then. So that first inflection point was in 2012 when we released the um, OHI framework and the first um, global assessment of ocean health. So this was published in, um, in Nature in 2012, and it was a huge collaborative effort um, to measure ocean health in a way that had never been done before, um, and in a, in a way that could be re repeated through time so that you'd be able to track uh, the changes in ocean health through time. So this was a real high point for us in 2012. 2013 was a low point when we actually tried to repeat our own methods a second time. But then today, um, we're better off than, than, than we had been, and we work now with a workflow that's transparent and repeatable. We've just released our fifth annual global assessment, and we're working with over 20 different um, 
countries, both governments and academics and uh, partnerships um, in between. Um, there's other, over 20 of these groups that are leading their own OHI assessments and we're helping them. Um, so this, this is the Story Arc of the Ocean Health Index and it's also going to be the talk outline that we follow for the, um, for the talk today. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell this story arc through the lens of how we now work in a transparent and repeatable way. Um, and I'll focus on that, um, that dive in 2013 and then how we've been overcoming it. And then um, Eric is going to tell more stories about some of the countries that we've been working with and what we've learned along the way. And this whole incline has been an iterative process as we've been teaching what we learn and then taking what we learn from um, countries themselves and then building our program um, to, to accommodate other groups better. Um, we actually have a couple papers in the pipeline about um, these these story arcs. So in a couple weeks, we've got a paper coming out in Nature Ecology and Evolution about how we work transparently and repeatably. Um, and we also have a, um, a paper about the um, five years of global assessments that's in review at the moment. So um, I'll start um, my story somewhere around 2012 and give a tiny bit of context about OHI just um, for anyone who's not familiar, although I know a lot of you are. and um, Ben Halpern and Steve Katona gave a webinar um, through um, the EVM network in, um, in March, and so that's archived as well if you're more interested in um, the OHI methods and the five years of global assessments. Okay, so um, the Ocean Health Index, we define a healthy ocean to be one that sustainably delivers a range of benefits to people now and in the future. So what this means in a nutshell is that we have this suite of benefits that we call goals. Um, and they, they are um, measured and combined into a score. And that score can be communicated um, to different audiences with, um, in part through this graphic that we call a flower plot. Um, this flower plot, each petal represents one of the goals and the length of that goal or benefit shows how close you are to meeting the management target that you've set. And then, um, but because all of the goals are on the same scale, you can compare between the goals and then have this single number representing the overall score, even though then you can dive more deeply into each individual goal itself. Um, so that's the, the highest level view of the OHI framework. But if we dig a little deep, deeper, um, the way you actually score those goals is by uh, developing models for them. And those models are going to be based on both the current status of that benefit and how it might change in the future based on the pressures that act upon it and resilience manage, um, measures that are often uh, through management. Um, and of course, underpinning um, goals and models and scores are a lot of planning and data. And I know I don't need to tell this audience that, um, that these, this is a hugely collaborative effort of trying to figure out um, what data are available and what could what could be modeled based on um, the current knowledge and uh, current knowledge of the of the system and and what what you're trying to achieve. Um, so this um, the idea though is that this doesn't end with scores, but that you actually use those scores to inform management. Um, and another thing is that this, although I'm representing this linearly, it's really not a linear cycle. This should be then repeated through time as well. So if you um, use your scores to inform policy, the idea would be that that would then inform the planning of your next assessment um, with new data so that you could use the same goals and the same models to create new scores and then continue to inform policy. Um, so the idea is the Ocean Health Index framework can be used repeatedly through time, but also done um, in different geographies as well, that it would be portable and usable in different places. So um, this is the process we go through when we do our global assessments, but also this is the way that folks in Sweden or in Ecuador or in Indonesia can also work as well. And the reason um, that this work, that this is transportable and, and usable in different geographies is because um, the OHI has kind of a it has a core part and a tailorable part to it. So the core part is what makes an OHI assessment an OHI assessment. 
And this is the idea that there's this suite of goals that will be combined in scores in a very specific way, which will lead to scores for management. Um, and the tailorable part, though, is, is what goals you're actually um, including in whatever geography you're assessing, and then what data are available and will be used, what management targets are, will be used, and then what models you'll actually make with this data. Um, so, the, so the fact that OHI assessments have this core structure but are still tailorable means that other groups wanting to assess um, their own ocean health can, um, can build off of what we've already done but tailor it to their own situation. So they don't have to start from scratch, but it's, they still have control over what their assessment will look like. Um, so that's a brief, really high-level um, view of the OHI framework, but um, I want to go back to our story arc um, and tell you what, yeah, uh, <laughs> tell you about the story arc. So um, like I said, 2012 is this year that we published um, the framework and uh, assessed global oceans for the first time. Um, this was a hugely collaborative effort. You can see there's um, 30 co-authors and it relied on 100 different public data sets, um, in, including um, data from the World Bank and, um, and big international groups like that. Um, so in 2012, we, we developed the framework, and we intended for this to be repeatable. So we took, really, um, we took a lot of dedication and care to documenting all of our scientific methods. We published 130 pages of supplemental methods so that we'd be able to repeat what we'd done. Um, and we, things were good. Things were really good in 2012. Um, the way that we worked um, in 2012 was by working the way we always had when it came to data. So we, um, this might look familiar to you, this, our data processing was largely done in Excel, which means a lot of copy pasting and different file versions um, that are that are then emailed back and forth to each other. Um, so we collaborated through by sharing these files through email, and um, sometimes these emails would be forwarded between team members if not everybody was included on the first one. Um, so seeing this, um, you can probably understand why this low point for 2013 um, happened. This happened when we tried to repeat our methods um, while looking at the way we had been working with data the first time. So, you know, while our scientific methods had been really well document, uh, documented, we learned the hard way that um, the way we were working with data and the way we were collaborating was not enough to, actually, to efficiently reproduce our own work. Um, in 2013 here, we spent a lot of time um, pouring through old email chains to try to find different versions of files, and then there was a lot of detective work to figure out what was different between these different file versions in order to do the same thing again on new data the second time. So this was a pretty humbling experience to, to sort of be, to face that we had a lot of difficulty with the way we've been working um, and to, to want to change it. Um, but I think our biggest challenge was changing our mindset and, and accepting that this was not a good way to work and trying to figure out a better way to work in order to move forward and continue the project and to be able to do assessments on an annual basis. Um, so the good news, though, is that we overcame, um, we overcame this by getting on board with practices and tools that Silicon Valley teams like Airbnb and Twitter use. Um, these, um, you know, they, they're using tools that have been specifically designed to collaborate with a lot of data with really complex um, systems. And so it, it only made sense that we started to use these tools for science as well. And you know, Airbnb and Twitter are definitely not emailing files of Excel data back and forth to each other. So we wanted to figure out what they were doing and start to do it too. So what this means is that we've learned to code and use version control, and we've learned to collaborate ba with software that's based on coding and version control. So what this means, um, version control is, um, is basically software that does all of that bookkeeping for you. It does. It, it knows who changed files when, and you are um, required to write a, a message to your future self to say what changed. So it takes care of a lot of the bookkeeping that everybody otherwise has to do on, them, um, on their own. 
Um, and then uh, collaborative software, um, so sorry, we, we code using R and we use version control, we use Git for version control, and then um, we use our studio and GitHub, which are super powerful tools that sort of leverage um, R and Git and, and make it really collaborative, um, and one is one of the things it does. So we've been able to um, code and use version control to provide a historical record of what we've done um, and have um, scripts that we can then rerun with new data. So reproducibility in data processing has been um, greatly enhanced. But then also um, on the collaborative side, we use best practices for collaboration. We consider our, our, we consider our collaborators to not only be us now, but us in the future. And us in the future can't um, rely on anything but written records that they can find. Um, there's no kind of memory that can be passed forward. So we've really um, been using these tools to collaborate with ourselves in the future and also share all of the information publicly and um, freely online. Um, it's, you know, it's taken, we've been working on this stuff for four years and it's been incremental um, that we've incorporated better practices into our workflow, but um, we've been able to um, learn from ourselves and from others and really improve as we go, sort of incrementally. Um, so I, we consider these tools to uh, facilitate open data science, which um, open science is the idea that tools are available for free and methods are, avail are accessible and data sharing and everything. And data science is a discipline for working deliberately with data. So um, all of these tools are available for free. Um, and have, there's a lot of documentation and powerful ways to learn online. So we think that this is not only lowering the barrier of entry for countries trying to do their own OHI assessments, but also for countries trying to do collaborative science um, at any, um, in any way. So um, I had said that you know, this, our OHI framework had this core part and then also this tailorable part, and we've used those tools to create a toolbox in that same, um, you know, mirroring that same structure. So we've made an R package that does all the core operations that you need to have for it to be an OHI assessment. And then we've got a um, GitHub repository, which essentially is a, is a folder online that has all the, um, all the files and um, sort of dummy data and um, scripted models that people can take full control over and tailor for their own assessments. Um, so with, um, with these tools, each um, we've been able to really reduce the amount of time it takes to repeat assessments. Um, we've, um, let's see, so this, this is an illustration from our, from our uh, paper that's coming out that's showing that the time and effort involved to repeat our global assessments has reduced through time. So the size of um, the circle in 2012 when we were developing the framework um, has been reducing as we've incorporated better practices for open data science and then in 2014 when we created the toolbox. Um, and so the idea too is that when new countries want to use um, the Ocean Health Index for their own assessments, they'll start somewhere around the uh, circle of 2014 because they get the toolbox in hand um, so the, again, this barrier to entry is lower, and then hopefully as they would repeat through time, their time would continue to get smaller as well. Um, but in any case, they're, they're not starting from scratch in 2012 the way we had. So um, this, uh, these tools um, for coding and version control in a collaborative way have really um, made our work transparent and reproducible, like um, our, our data methods are are better off without a question. But what's also really powerful is that um, you can use the same suite of tools for communication. Um, so we use these tools not only for science and sort of software development, but also to create all of our training materials and to, de to, ve to develop our website and other web pages and um, shareable web, um, interactive graphics and um, also uh, electronic books. We've started curating books for with our training materials. So it's really um, they're really powerful for communication, and it's and it's cool that it's the same suite of tools and the same workflow that's required to um, 
to use for communication so that that makes communication part of our workflow and not something that is like a separate thing to do, but it's, it's wrapped up in the way that we work. Um, so we do um, all of these things uh, with this suite of tools, but um, that, that's just the back end of what we do. On, on the front end, we're repeating these assessments globally every year, um, and we de have developed this whole, this whole program called OHI Plus, um, which are for groups leading their own independent assessments in their own jurisdictions. And that's what Eric is going to talk about in just one moment. Um, and like I said, we created the toolbox software and our websites with this as well. So we've been able to um, have sort of our, our back end and our front end um, totally done with these tools and everything is, is open and available online. Um, so yeah, just to summarize, um, I, um, these, these, both these tools and the OHI program um, make our, our work transparent reproducible and streamlined, and, and like I said, it lowers the barriers of entry for other groups. So um, I think it's been like incredibly fun to develop this program and to especially work with Eric, and it's been a really iterative process as we've been working with countries and, um, and coding, and so now, now when Eric uh, teaches workshops, he's not only teaching the Ocean Health Index framework, but he's teaching um, our studio and, and GitHub to countries all around the world. So. I will um, sign off now and let Eric continue. Great, thanks, Julie. Um, can people hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, wonderful. Uh, well, uh, my name is Eric Pacheco, and uh, I'm at Conservation International, and uh, uh, thank you, Sarah, and your team for having us today. Um, so, uh, as Julie mentioned, uh, the Ocean Health Index is a partnership between uh, NCs at UC Santa Barbara and Conservation International and it's it's been a really good partnership because uh, we at Conservation International we are really at the forefront of engaging with countries and the governments and uh, stakeholders in, in ocean and coastal resource management in, in various geographies around the world. So for us it's been a process of not only taking the tools that we've developed and implementing them, but the, the we've also learned a lot from our users. And so what I'm going to be focusing more is the process that we've followed for translating the science into action and also how we've learned from applying these um, techniques around the world. So um, as we began doing the, the Ocean Health Index, and, and Julie mentioned we launched the Ocean Health Index in 2012, and the initial response to this global assessment, uh, which is right now assessing 220 uh, EECs around the world, was for countries to want to do their own assessments. Of course, anytime you give a country a score, um, the initial reaction was, well, we want to understand better how these things were done, how, what kind of data sets were used, what kind of targets were used. Uh, and so we recognized that there was a real need to scale down the Ocean Health Index from the global level to the national and subnational levels because ultimately that's where most management decisions are made. Um, and so we had to really begin a process of understanding how we, we go about scaling the Ocean Health Index down. So one of the very first lessons that we learned uh, in 2013, that's uh, when both me and Julie started working actively on doing this, was um, that it's not enough to know how to do something. We really had to develop a set of dedicated, dedicated instructional materials and mechanisms to teach people a new way of thinking about integrated ocean and coastal management and shifting away from traditional ways of, of teaching uh, science into more of a science to policy and science to management. And so what that resulted on was we had to focus a lot on capacity development and we uh, began by developing a manual and doing a lot of workshops with the technical teams in the countries and the stakeholders in the various countries in which we work. Uh, and we did a lot of virtual trainings, one-on-one -on -one troubleshooting, but even that, uh, we recognized that we were becoming uh, a barrier of entry. Our own team's bandwidth was becoming a barrier. So we developed a, a, a portal for capacity development. It's ohhiscience.org, and I encourage you to explore it. 
And that was uh, a collaborative effort where we put in a lot of the lessons learned from our users uh, in, in this website, but it also allows us to uh, have forums and community of practices so that the users are actually interacting with one another and they can ask us questions and we're publishing them in these forums. Um, and, but we also developed, uh, identified that it's not just a matter of uh, teaching the Ocean Health Index uh, and the science behind the Ocean Health Index, but also we had to teach people how to use open science tools, tools that Julie was just described that we had to develop so that we could replicate our own work. We, we recognize that most countries could also benefit from having these systematized mechanisms for uh, monitoring continuously ocean and coastal resources. Um, and so um, I'm going to weave um, our lessons learned and through the examples that and the countries that we work with. So China was one of the very first countries that showed interest in wanting to do their own assessment. And um, we began working with the Chinese State Oceanic Administration back in 2012. And in 2013, we held uh, one uh, first technical workshop. In 2014, we followed it with another workshop. And ultimately, what all of these trainings and working with the technical team in China resulted in the development of the China Ocean Health Handbook, which was basically they customized the Ocean Health Index to the Chinese context. And they used, uh, I think it was 123 data sets uh, from the Chinese context. Um, and most importantly, they began weaving the findings of these assessments into their uh, plans. So in China, you have um, five-year plans that are done uh, on a regular basis. And so this coincided with the planning for the 13th five-year plan, which is from 2016 to 2020. And so what we're seeing is that the findings from these this very first assessment that was done in China has already been woven to, into decision making at the provincial level. Um, and so, uh, as you can see, Julie showed you earlier, this is the flower plot that resulted from the Chinese assessment. One of the questions that people always asked us was, well, do you think countries are going to give themselves really high grades or going to give themselves scores of 100 across the board by evaluating themselves? But what we've actually found is the opposite, is that when countries assess themselves, they tend to set more ambitious targets. And what's resulted is actually in lower scores, but that are more grounded on reality and on the management objectives of the countries. And so. Um, we've done a lot of workshops in China. We have a, a good ongoing relationship with the State Oceanic Administration. We're hoping to continue working in China over time. And so this is an example of a workshop we held back in 2015. Um, so uh, another lesson that we learned uh, was that the Ocean Health Index was not just about getting scores at the end. And, and our initial uh, thought was that uh, countries would be really keen on assessing themselves and getting a sense of scores, but we found that countries were mostly finding this useful for its process too, and how it would allow them to organize their institutions, organize their information, organize their targets. And so as a result of this feedback we were getting from the countries and then seeing how a lot of our user countries were, were using the tools, we developed this four-phase uh, process uh, that is focusing a lot on building the capacity or developing the capacity of the countries, not only on OHI science, but also on the open science tools. But then we also recognize that there was a lot of need for developing a dedicated stakeholder engagement mechanism where we're understanding the needs of the stakeholders, their values, perspectives, cultural priorities, so that we could integrate those into the assessments to make sure that the assessments are yielding results that are useful to management and decision making and that there is a, a high degree of ownership in, in the findings and, and their assessment results. Then the third phase is uh, uh, conducting the science, of course, and lastly, informing policy and governance. So we had to also start thinking about how do we develop the channels to allow stakeholders to test different management scenarios and how would uh, different courses of action have impacts on the score, so that way they can start identifying 
the most cost-effective and, um, uh, and appropriate management interventions for, for the context. So a good example in this case is what Indonesia has been doing. We began working with Indonesia in 2015. It was actually much to our surprise because Indonesia was one of the first countries to openly reject the Ocean Health Index back in 2012. But once we started developing all these tools that put them in control, then they recognized that they could actually benefit a lot from this. And uh, one of the things that we also see is that for them, the process is proven just as valuable, if not more, if not more valuable than the, than the results themselves. And so they've woven this into their uh, five-year plan from 2019 to 2024. And what's most importantly is that uh, in talking to the Ministry of development, they were telling us that we have an index to measure our forest quality, our air quality, our water quality. So having an index that helps us understand how well we're doing in terms of ocean management kind of gives us a full picture of how we're doing in, in terms of the environment. The other thing that we recognized in working with Indonesia was that there was a need to ground truth a lot of these management targets and objectives into um, things that are actually going on the ground. So here in the case of Indonesia, they decided to start working on Bali and then uh, in West Papua. And what they're hoping is to use these two sites as pilots so that they can begin to understand how they can actually implement some of these higher level objectives and targets that they've set for them at national levels. And also there's a lot of alignment with sustainable development goals. In fact, just uh, in March, we held a, a national level conference in Jakarta to discuss how uh, is the Ocean Health Index going to help Indonesia achieve uh, SDG 14 and other sustainable development goals. And actually right now, um, the Ocean Health Index is one of the proposed indicators for measuring uh, the progress on um, target 14.2. Um, and then lastly, uh, we also recognize that one of the biggest challenges in ocean and coastal management around the world is that government agencies and stakeholders are not collaborating and working with one another. And so we see, we saw here in Indonesia that this opened the door for a lot of government agencies to start working with each other. We had the Ministry of Planning and Development, the Coordinating Ministry for Oceans, the Ministry of Oceans and Fisheries, um, and ministries of tourism, a lot of um, uh, universities and research institutions getting involved. So we held um, an initial national level workshop back in 2016, in April of 2016. And now this is a workshop we just held with a thing called team in Bali just uh, in March of this year. So we've seen a lot of collaboration between private sector, resource users, universities, and the government, which is precisely uh, what we want uh, because it's not, uh, it also helps make these assessments more bottom up than just top, top down. The other lesson that we learned is that um, the OHI framework is much more than just an assessment tool. It actually lends itself pretty well to, um, to help countries start really thinking how do we manage ocean and coastal resources from an integrated perspective. So this picture that you see here at the bottom is actually an infographic that was created during a workshop that we had in Colombia in 2015. And one of the things that we, we've learned in, in the case of Colombia is one of my uh, favorite ones to share because it's a good example of in Colombia they weren't um, as excited or as interested in uh, developing the assessments but for them it was more about how do they organize their information and how do they organize their institutions so that they can standardize the processes of monitoring uh, and evaluating their performance. And so the Ocean Health Index is providing them with a framework to organize data and information. But most importantly, is as they began exploring the, the option of doing an assessment, they realized that they didn't have the adequate indicator frameworks. And so they did an in, uh, a process of uh, a couple of years where they developed a national ocean indicator framework that has 111 different indicator across ecological, socioeconomic, and physical uh, elements. And then they standardize the, those processes across all scales of management. So now they standardize processes 
capacities and protocols for data gathering. They've built capacity at the lowest levels of management all the way to the higher levels of management. And they aligned uh, management targets of both five and 10 years, which is uh, coincides with um, the presidential terms so that it gives them a sense of, of how they're performing in each one of these categories over time. And so for us, this is a good example and it was a little bit of a, a, a wake up call that, hey, you know, the Ocean Health Index is not just about doing the science, it's actually allowing a lot of government agencies to work with one another and collaborate and foster this uh, relationship. So this was the first uh, Ocean Health Index workshop we did in Colombia and I don't know if you see the logo, they put the Colombian flag in there and we ha have a really good working relationship with the Colombian Oceans Commission which is part of the Vice Presidency and this was the second technical workshop on identifying all the indicators and that was in uh, November of 2015. And through this process, one thing that we've learned is that um, we've really had to work hard on changing the approaches and mindsets that people have towards ocean and coastal management. So for a long time, uh, most uh, natural resource management in the oceans were no different. We're very top down. So it was government managing and it was very command and control using sticks rather than carrots. And so it, it's in shifting those mindsets and approaches, we realize that management of ocean and coastal resources is much better when it's participatory and then moving away from being sector-based so managing tourism or managing fisheries or managing habitats towards uh, more things uh, all these components are also interacting with one another and, and that brings me to the last point here is that before we were also just very indicator based we were monitoring different indicators and we had targets and we could see how an indicator was performing throughout time but one of the things that we really need to do is understanding how all the indicators are interacting with one another so for example if we were to increase um, shipping or if we were to increase tourism how is that going to affect biodiversity or how is um, increasing commercial fishing going to affect artisanal fishing. So understanding these interactions between the different components is really important. And, um, and the other thing is in, in terms of uh, participatory ocean governance, one of the things that we recognize is that most uh, countries are ill-organized to uh, effectively implement integrated ocean and coastal management. So one of the th main things that we've been doing over the past three and a half, four years now is working with the countries to develop multidisciplinary uh, working groups which are serve as coordinating mechanisms to bring together all these different stakeholder groups and then build the capacity of dedicated multidisciplinary technical teams across universities and governments so that we have a go-to uh, body that, that we can use to implement this. But it's not just for the Ocean Health Index, it's for all of the other ocean and coastal initiatives the other thing we recognize is that countries are already busy. Most countries, their reporting requirements for Aichi targets or uh, IUCN Red List or any other kind of convention uh, around the world, it's already sucking up a lot of their time. So rather than giving them more work, we wanted to figure out, well, how do we actually integrate all of these mandates and all of these um, conventions that they're already signatories to into the Ocean Health Index framework so that by doing an OHI, they're actually helping to fulfill multiple requirements. And so one of the main things we're doing now is integrating national development agenda targets and international agreements, so things like SDGs, into the OHI framework so it helps the countries fulfill many targets at once. And lastly, is really ensure that the assessments and our management approach is really responding to the needs and priorities of the stakeholders. And in doing that, we found far more um, interest and far more receptiveness to the ideas of trying to change the way people go about ocean management. And so one of the ways we've gone about doing this is identifying in each one of those countries, what are the national agenda plans? So in, in, we've, in the case, for example, of Ecuador, we use the National Plan for Good Living. Uh, and when we would develop the OHI for the Gulf of Guayaquil, we integrated some of those targets in there and same thing in the case of China. Uh, in New Caledonia we had they had the marine park um, 
um, management plan, and so we integrated some of those targets. And in the Baltic, we used the Helcom, but we're also using some international level mandates, things like the SDGs, IUCN Red List, um, World Health Organization, CBD, etc. Which brings me to my very last example, which is our engagements with Mexico, which began about uh, two years ago, and it's been uh, a very fascinating process because in Mexico, ocean management has been incredibly top-down, and so the government, the Secretariat of Natural Resources and Environment, recognized that they were going to uh, they weren't going to meet their ambitious targets unless they got all their stakeholders involved. And uh, the public universities in Mexico actually do a fantastic job at conducting ocean and coastal research, but that information was not being shared with public institutions. So they wanted to put in place uh, a process where they had a lot of the stakeholders involved in ocean management actively in supporting the government. And the idea in Mexico is to, they have four defined marine areas, two in the Caribbean and the Atlantic side and two on the Pacific side. And they want to develop independent assessments for each one of these four regions and make sure that there is a lot of stakeholder involve, involvement, that the targets and the indicators that are used are representative of what the people want to develop. And so it gives them a, a sense of we can measure performance throughout time at both national levels, but also at subnational levels. So we're aggregating up rather than disaggregating from the national level to the subnational level. So I just shared with you uh, four examples. Uh, however, we are working um, in many other geographies around the world. Um, this is a map uh, that's actually, uh, we, we actually have to update it because we have to add a few more countries that just came on board recently. But we have a lot of presence in, throughout the Americas. In the Pacific, we have a project in Hawaii and New Caledonia and in Samoa. One of our first uh, case studies was done in Fiji and in Asia. We're working in it primarily in China and Indonesia and in South Korea, uh, in Europe, in the Baltic Sea and in Spain and in the Mediterranean in Israel, which was one of the early adopters. Most recently, we actually just got a grant to start implementing OHI in Kenya and Tanzania. Um, and so as you can see, we are also working in the Arctic and in Canada and the U.S. East Coast, actually part of the, the very first national uh, ocean plan was uh, the Ocean Health Index is one of the components that's going to be used. So in terms of uh, thinking about other benefits to the users, we've recognized that one of the things we hear all the time is, well, we don't have all this, uh, the data and the indicators that we need. But Perhaps as part of the process, there's known unknowns and unknowns unknowns. And so part of the process is also identifying what kinds of information do we need to make decisions. And figuring out what you need to make those decisions is just as important as figuring out what you already have. The second is increasing the cost effectiveness of management interventions. We recognize that countries have very limited resources for ocean and coastal management. So if we can identify both geographic and thematic priorities and allocate the resources where they, the, they're going to be more, most effective and where we're going to get the greatest benefit for the least amount of resources, then we're going to have greater impact and as a consequence improve uh, the delivery of those benefits to people both now and in the future. Uh, and uh, again, we haven't done this by ourselves. Uh, we've had the, a lot of partners around the world, and we've been very fortunate to uh, count with their input and continuous feedback. So as I mentioned, the State Oceanic Administration, Bapenas uh, in Indonesia, NOAA uh, is working with us in Hawaii, Semarnat in Mexico, Ocean Commission in Colombia, Korean Maritime Institute, Hamarag in Israel the Indian Ocean Commission in East Africa, Stockholm Resilience Center, and so on. Um, and so um, before I finish, I just want to share with you some of the um, our next steps or our vision. So we recognize that our, country, our, our, our own team's bandwidth still remains a, um, a barrier of entry. So we're really working on increasing a lot of autonomy and putting all of our tools online. So I encourage you to explore ohi-science.org. Uh, and so we're trying to really remove ourselves as the gatekeepers and working towards creating a global community of practice. And we're seeing a lot of that already as countries are actually already beginning to partner with one another and collaborate. And we're seeing actually regional level initiatives 
for example, in the Southeast Pacific, so Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Panama, and Chile, um, they're working together, and for us, that's a, a great way to approach ocean management because it has to be transboundary in nature. Um, and lastly, really focus on informing decision making. Uh, right now, we've only had repeated assessments uh, at the global level, and so we're working with our partner countries to really focus on reassess over time so that we can actually put in place adaptive management measures and we can see what whether the management interventions are getting the countries um, towards their stated targets. So I'll leave it at that so we still have about 15 minutes to take uh, some questions but uh, thank you very much for having us. Okay thank you so much Eric and Julia um, and just remind everyone out how to ask questions, you can type the questions into the question panel of the user interface, uh, and then I will relay them to Julian and Eric. Okay, um, so this was a question that came in uh, relatively early on. Um, can the structure of the OHI change depending on the country trying to carry out the OHI? That is, is it possible for countries to adjust some of the components of goals, including new ones and excluding some existing goals, to study what happens with ocean health? Yeah, indeed. Um, actually, do you, do you want to go, Julie, or do you want to no, just... Go ahead, go ahead, Eric. Yeah, actually, so part of the process of uh, how we begin working with countries is um, we, we have to go through a process where we're, we are learning about the country and they, the country partners are learning about the OHI, but precisely when we talk about uh, customizing the Ocean Health Index and developing these uh, OHI independent assessments, uh, part of the process is to identify which goals are relevant to measuring in each context. Uh, and then we can also change the models, the indicators that are used for measuring each goal, the target, so it's highly, highly customizable for each country context. Okay, thank you. And Julie, did want, do you want to add anything or we'll go uh, on? No, uh, that's, that's exactly what I was going to say. So. Great, okay. Um, there's another question. How do you weigh the individual elements, such as species versus leisure, to get an overall value? Does it defer by country or ocean? So um, at the moment, they are all weighted equally, that, so that biodiversity is as equal as livelihoods or tourism. And that's kind of uh, that's a default, because we don't actually know how people value those things across global assessments. Um, but that is one of the parts that's tailorable or customizable. Um, if you're leading an assessment and you know that in your area fishing is more important than biodiversity or something, um, you would be able to, to weigh those goals differently. Um, and something that is, has been done that's pretty neat is in Canada, which is also one of the first assessments, is they did a, um, a nationwide survey asking people to, to rank and declare their preferences between those 10 goals in order to weigh them differently. And they saw some really interesting patterns based on um, location and age and a lot of other demographics. So it's hard to find a weighting that fits um, everybody's perspective. So in the meantime, by default, we, we weigh them equally. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, there's a question. There are two sites where you can see the 10 goals and the international results with their respective components, oceanhealthindex.org and ohi-science.org. But in some cases, the components within ohi-science.org do not appear on oceanhealthindex.org and vice versa. Does this influence data collection and measurement by countries in the construction of OHI plus? Um, so the, the two websites are both run by us, and um, the oceanhealthindex.org is kind of the overview website, um, and ohiscience.org is more of the technical website. So we tend to update ohiscience.org um, really frequently as we're um, starting up the next global assessment or as we're preparing for a workshop, and so that's um, it's more of a dynamic website maybe. Um, so they, they're always in sync, but sometimes ohiscience.org has, um, it's trying to reach uh, maybe a wider audience because that's also where our training program is and where we share our data from. So they're, um, they're sort of uh, complementary websites that are both run by us. 
Okay. Yeah, and just to add one more thing is that the oceanhealthindex.org is more of a public facing uh, website, so it's intended for a more general audience, whereas ohiscience.org is uh, more intended towards uh, users, the people that are go going to be implementing the OHI in their own geographies. And so it's geared towards managers and scientists and, and, and we've equipped it with a lot of tools and we're constantly updating it based on feedback and there's a forum in there. So we really enc encourage you to explore because um, you might find a lot of the uh, answers to your questions in there as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a question, are there standardized qualifications for participant countries? Do participants need a particular type of educational background? Um, no, we, um, we're on the idea that if we work openly and people are interested, um, people can, can do these themselves. Um, sometimes we learn that people are using our GitHub repositories and doing their own assessments without even letting us know, um, and that's feel like that's the way it should be. We shouldn't have to be a gatekeeper at all for anybody who wants to use our work. Okay, great. Yeah, and um, to add a little bit to that is uh, doing an OHI assessment is by nature a, a collaborative effort. I think no single individual would be able to do a whole country level assessment on their own um, just because you need to make some informed decisions and uh, and so um, there isn't really a, a prerequisite in terms of your capacity, but it's really more about do you have the right people around the table? And sometimes that, and the kind of going back to the process being just as important as the science, is having the right people and the right stakeholders and getting their buy-in uh, is really a, a, a one of the biggest requirements because we've also had the case where we've done amazing science uh, at the very beginning of our of our learning, uh, we did some really great assessments, but we didn't really plug them into the local governance and to decision making. And there was very little stakeholder engagement. And what resulted was it was just another scientific paper that sat on a shelf, and people might you know cite it here and there, but it's had very little consequence in terms of management. And so that's why we highlight a lot of that stakeholder engagement process. Okay, great. Um, we have another one. Thank you for an interesting webinar. I'd like to know how much time the OHI plus process can take depending on the type slash number of customizations. That's a great question. Um, there's no satisfying answer. Um, it depends on how much you plan to customize it. You, we we um, provide countries with um, global based scores for their nation when they start. So depending on how much of their own local data they can introduce into the assessment, um, um, it will take longer. And it's obviously better the more local information you can include, but it's also a starting point to um, do a pilot study with a, just a few goals or so. Um, but it, so it depends on how much you want to change, but it also depends on your team. Um, we found that um, having a few full-time people dedicated to thinking through the process and analyzing the data and learning the open data science tools um, makes a huge difference and, and keeping the, the continuity of the team as, as that happens. Um, so in our experience, um, two years might be a rule of thumb, but that really depends on the amount of people involved in the scale of, um, of the assessment. So I don't know, Eric, if you want to add anything to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think um, it really depends also the, the scope of, of your project. Um, we've had, in the case of the Gulf of Guayaquil, they had a 12-people te uh, team full-time, and so they did it all in nine months, and they actually customized, I think, 87% of, of the data sets were different. Um, and so they did a lot of customization, but we've also had projects have around three or four years. Um, so there's no right or wrong answer. It, it really depends on on how you're weaving this through the through your management needs and objectives. And sometimes setting the right foundation is perhaps more important than just cranking out the science. And one thing that um, as Julie mentioned in that graph is that over time it actually takes 
um, less doing those repeated assessments takes less time. So basically, the first assessment you do is is going to be very upfront, heavy in terms of time, but they will gradually take less and less time to do because you have set out that uh, scientific foundation. And so in the future, it'll be just a matter of just simply updating the data sets and then letting the code just do all the calculations. And so in many ways, when we think about establishing automated systems for ocean and coastal management, that is what we want to see countries do. And we recognize that there's an upfront in terms of time, but that over time, the entire um, overall time will be much less than if you had to do assessments from scratch uh, using different methodologies. Okay, great, thank you. Um, another question, are you aware of the OHI framework being adapted for use at a small-scale watershed level? Um, let's see, um, there's been pretty small assessments that have been done so far. Um, Israel is a really good example that's not just a watershed level, but it's pretty small. Um, also, the, the Bay of Fundy um, did an assessment to understand their, um, the bay up there. Um, maybe another good example, though, would be um, a group like um, Hawaii that's planning to incorporate a lot of the watersheds into their assessments at the island scale. Um, those are the first that come to my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the Gulf of Guayaquil in, uh, in Ecuador was also fairly small uh, assessment. Um, so it really depends. One thing to take into consideration is that in the OHI framework, as Julie mentioned, a, a good component is on pressures and resilience. And the idea is here to provide management guidelines to, to decision makers. And so uh, there might be more adequate tools for managing a really, really small scales where you have a lot of exogenous pressures that are beyond the control of local managers. Uh, but um, our rule of thumb is that assessments should always be done uh, so that they match the scale of decision making so the findings can readily be implemented into decision making. So there isn't really a too large or too small, uh, but you do have to take those things into consideration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a good balance is often, oh, sorry, just one more thing. A good balance is often, um, yeah, the, the, the need for an assessment at that scale and then whether there's data and management and knowledge to, um, to accommodate that. Okay, and we have several more questions, um, but we'll just tackle one of them, I think. Um, there was a quick question. Um, do you deal with any microplastics, any microplastic measurements, and can it help with that? So microplastics would be a pressure um, across many of the goals. Um, but at the moment, it's not included because there's not um, data um, that we've seen so far at the, um, so that it's not included in global assessments. But if you're working at a scale where there are data for microplastics, that could certainly be incorporated as a pressure. Okay. We do have a trash global data set. Um, it's not perfect, but it's included into the pressures uh, framework. So it's not specific on microplastics, but it's trash in general. Okay, great. Well, let's do one more, and this will be absolutely the last one. Uh, some of the criteria areas ha seem to have a lot of su subjectivity. How do you standardize results year to year and country to country? So that's a great question. Um, we work really hard to make sure our global assessments, when they're repeated through time, are comparable through time. So that means that if a new data set shows up in one year, um, we will back calculate the past years as well with that data so that those will be comparable. And likewise, if we um, update a method for data processing or even a reference point, we always retroactively back calculate the rest of this years so that we can compare through time. Um, and But that means that if a country is doing their own assessment, their scores will be with their own data and their own management targets. And those scores will not be directly comparable to global scores at that point. However, um, because they're all scored on, a, um, on one of these flower plots from 0 to 100, you can you can 
you can not compare them quantitatively, but you can compare them in the sense that um, country X is closer to their management targets than the global assessment would have indicated. Okay. All right. This was great. We had great Q&A. Then thank you to everyone who sent in questions and a great presentation. Thank you so much, Julia and Eric. Um, so we're really glad to have you on and we look forward to learning more about the OHI and your work in the future. Um, so I'll just end by uh, hoping, wishing everyone good luck with their work and a uh, good, good end to their day. Thanks Thank so much. you, Sarah. And if okay. you have any questions, feel pr please pl uh, feel free to email us. Actually, my email is epacheco at conservation.org, but you can also find uh, all of our contact information in either one of our websites. Okay. Thank you, and bye, everyone. Bye-bye.